my thoughts on business leadership uh, really relate very closely to, to sport. I've been involved with sport my whole life. And in our organization, we don't have the concept of a manager. We have a concept of a team leader. Uh, and I always relate that back to a rugby team. We've got a captain. You've got a, a captain of the pack. You've got a captain of the back line. You have a leader, someone that can mold people together, someone that can uh, give them direction. And when things are down and things are looking tough, uh, they can really get them their chins up and get them going forward. So my concept of leadership is really about being able to identify uh, what, what's happening with people at that point in time, um, how to, to identify when they're down, how to be able to lift those chins up. And uh, things don't always go according to plan in business. And uh, when they do go according to plan, you have to celebrate from the front like a leader. But when things don't, you need to be able to pick them up as well. As a youngster, I wasn't really exposed to too many leaders except for a short part of my education while I was at CBC. I went to a Catholic school. I wasn't a Catholic boy, but I went to a Catholic school. And the brothers set such high standards in those days that it, it really gave me uh, a lot of positive encouragement and I enjoyed the process. And uh, when I left school and uh, joined the army, there were some leaders there that might not have been for the right reasons, but there were some leaders that were able to stand up when the chips were down and you looked at this guy and he might have been a captain or lieutenant and uh, in the tough times he, uh, he stood up and was counted and to me those leaders were people that, uh, that, that set the mark and that was my first real exposure. But in business, my first real exposure came to uh, a business that I joined, it was uh, the business that I currently now own, uh, it was a guy who was the sales director of that business, a guy called Brian Armstrong. And Brian has gone on to lead a number of listed companies globally and, and he's done very, very well for himself. But he led from the front. He set the examples. Uh, he really put the people together and he helped mentor people, which really was for me something I had to learn to do because up until that time, I really was in it for myself, I suppose. Uh, but he really helped uh, me open my eyes to see what we can do if people are prepared to work together. And that is really the concept we have today, where uh, our team, we might not have one individual brilliant person, but we've got uh, 80 fantastic people in our team who really together we can stand up against anyone in the world. And, and that, that is really where it started, the journey started. I've had a few leaders uh, since then that have influenced my life and influenced my decisions, but that is really how it started. My journey uh, started about 29 years ago, where I joined uh, a, a big listed business and I joined this business as the national sales manager um, and we broke the business down into smaller units and those smaller units meant that it that didn't really need a full national sales manager anymore and uh, I was moved to and I chose to move to Cape Town which is I always left to live in Cape Town and uh, we built a branch started with two people and after 12 months of doing very very hard work and working 14 hour days we decided to work that hard for someone else that was just not on and my wife and I went out and we found a business that made pool tables. And uh, I told the sales director we were going to be resigning. I gave him three months notice because we want to paddle our own ship and we're going to build our own business making pool tables. Uh, they thought, well, their business in Cape Town hadn't done uh, as well as it done in the last 12 months. And they said, hold on, maybe we can put something together. And they created a franchise operation where I could buy the Cape Town business on a franchise business franchise operation. The following year, I bought the Durban business and a franchise business. And a year or two later, I bought the Johannesburg office. So uh, we then owned the entire franchise to distribute the products, uh, which were at the time Solution 6 products, which came out of uh, Australia. And uh, we did very well as a distributor. But as a distributor, you have a different set of skills to being a pure entrepreneur. You might be building a business, but you are building it uh, based on other people's criteria. In the late 1990s, uh, 1999, as the uh, year 2000 boom was, was happening, everyone was riding the crest of the wave in the IT stocks globally. Uh, a lot of people took the pedal off the metal when it came to spending on R&D. They were so hung up with uh, riding the hype on the share prices that they didn't continue to invest in the te core technology. And that resulted in the products that we were getting not being up to standard in, in our opinion anymore. So we ended up getting divorced from uh, Solution 6. Uh, and in uh, April 2000, we'd bought our own product, which uh, really was not up to the standard of Solution 6 in those days, but it was our own product. 
And that resulted in us having to learn a new set of skills completely because as opposed to receiving product, we now had to build this thing from the ground up. And we went from a business that had about 600 clients in South Africa and our clients being accountants and auditors. Uh, we lost close to 400 of those and we ended up with a client base of about 1,400 people uh, and just over 10 people in the team. So it was a very small team. And we had to build this thing from scratch again. So we had to learn a whole new set of skills, which for the next two, three, four years, we went out there and just built new products, tried to keep the clients happy. One of the cornerstones of the things that we've always done is uh, have a family concept in our business where our clients are part of that family. So we never wanted to let them down. And it was really tough to try and make sure both our internal team, as part of the family, and the clients were happy in a stage that we were building uh, and building and competing with very good international products, uh, which today we now dominate that space. So we've been very, very successful in doing that. And, and during that time when we were building, building the business in the early 2000s, it was really, really tough. There were many, many paydays that, that uh, myself and my partner at the time never got paid. Uh, if I go back to my concept of leadership where it comes down to sport, in those days I was intimately involved with Ironman and Berg River Canoe Marathons and Comrades and I had fantastic learning out of those experiences and if I just mention one of them, the Berg River Canoe Marathon, which for everyone who doesn't know is a 228k race over four days, it's really, really tough and we had really, really tough conditions and uh, in the last day with 20k's to go, uh, that year, the winner of the Iron Man uh, actually bailed and didn't finish because it was so tough. And we finished. And we often refer, and I say we, myself and my partners, refer to the hanging in and never ever giving up. And when we got there, that's one of my most treasured sport medals. But in the same way, the business went through very, very tough times. Tough times financially. We lost a lot of clients and uh, we never ever gave up. And uh, we started to build this culture within Greatsoft that we don't give up. And the result of that is I have people in our team who are now been with me for 20 years. In fact, I've got 25, 26 year veterans in our team. But we've got a number of people that are approaching the 20 year mark. And a lot of those people have the same culture of never giving up. In the same way, there was a lesson that I learned from one of the comrades I did. I did three comrades, two I finished. The only race in my entire life I've never finished was one of the comrades. And the, the psychological setback for me of not finishing was another lesson that we take into business because uh, you can complete everything. You just got to keep going. Uh, and I never completed that, comrades. It took me a long time to recover from that and to get that going. And we refer that uh, often, to refer to that story often when we're in business, say, do we have to give up now or can we keep going? And when we keep going, we often turn out substantially better than... Uh, uh, then giving up. That does not mean that when you have a bad thing, a bad apple, you must throw it out quickly. And that's another lesson we've learned is uh, we've made some investments over, over the past uh, few years and some of them have not always been successful. Uh, and the earlier that you address that, uh, the unsuccessful ones, the better for you. So uh, that lesson of not finishing the comrades taught me the good and the bad of not completing an event. And that's really filtered through to our business, uh, business lives. For me, a big learning curve was learning to handle failure. In the, in the time when we moved from being a distributor to being a developer and, and distributor in own right of software, we lost a lot of clients. And some of those clients had been my friends, had been with us for a very long time and some very big firms. And uh, when you pick up that phone and the client's saying, we don't want to do business with you next year, and that's happening uh, all the time, it's a very, very hard blow to follow. And you need to be able to lift your head up and pick up the phone and phone the next guy and be positive about what you're doing. But the spin off and spill over to that, to the team around you, when they're thinking, wow, we're losing uh, this client, we're losing that client. And in your heart, you know that you're doing things for the right reasons. You're building something that is, is gonna be lasting, but it's very, very tough. And losing those clients, especially the very big clients, one of the lessons that really taught me those big clients where maybe 80% uh, of our revenue came from 20% of our clients made me change my attitude to putting all my eggs in one basket. And today, the split is really across the board. We don't have any one or two or three clients that produces more than five or six or 7% of our revenue. Uh, the majority is equally split. And that was a learning curve that we took out of that painful experience of losing those clients. The upside of that is today, when we look back at that, we can refer to that. And the team around us that certainly went through the pain with us in those days, and the new team members, when we tell them the stories of losing all those clients and how we continue to grow, 
uh, and they now look at our churn today, which is less than 2%, uh, we really don't lose many clients. If we do lose them, it's uh, through mergers or acquisitions. So we certainly don't lose clients anymore. And that has been a fantastic learning curve. We've come out of that feeling much stronger than we did uh, if we didn't have that experience. One of the focuses of our business has always been not to just sell a product, but we've had this concept of partnership with our clients. So we partner with our clients to try and uh, not only implement our products there, but to try and help them be more profitable. And in doing so, we've become leaders in the profession that we're in, which is really the accounting profession. Um, and we really understand how those businesses can make more money. So it's very good for us to be able to implement products that can help them make more money. And what we've come to realize is that they're in the same situation as we are, in that they are building relationships with their clients. And for them to manage that relationship is very, very difficult, although it shouldn't be. But they want to be able to manage the relationship from their iPad or from their mobile device or from anywhere at any time. They want to be able to answer a tax query that the client might have. Or they might want to, a client might say, who are the directors of my company? They want to be able to answer that immediately. They want to be able to do marketing and target market a certain segment of their client base. And to that end, we've always delivered the products that answered those questions at the tax administration level or the corporate registry level. But the relationship that our clients have with their clients has always been a bit of a gray area. And over the last five or six years, we've invested heavily in building a customer relationship module, which really is the glue that puts all of those other modules together. Uh, the other modules are seriously important, but the CRM component for us uh, will help our clients and our clients being the Grant Thorntons or Mazars or Nolans or KPMG to help manage the relationship with their clients, which in turn helps them improve the profitability of each project with their client because they, they don't lose opportunities and they can target opportunities better. So for us, it's been a, a, a very enlightening journey implementing CRM as opposed to delivering other product. Uh, the other products necessary, but it's the CRM that helps them to improve their profitability. And that's really what keeps our relationship uh, uh, going. For us, retaining a client is absolute. We do our absolute best never ever to, to lose a client. And uh, I know virtually every single one of our 800 clients. Uh, I might not know them as well as I used to know them, but I certainly know them. Uh, my managing director knows all of our clients substantially better than I do. Uh, our operations team leader would know them a lot better than, than he would know them. And if there's any cracks in the woodwork or we, we identify any areas where people are saying, hold on, they're unhappy about a certain area, um, we would get involved. And I'm always happy my cell phone is provided to all of our clients at any point in any time, day or night, that they can get all of us. And the benefit of that is that we pick up things before they start to fall over. So we use that exact same CRM system that we're delivering to our clients. And if any uh, noise is heard in our uh, consulting team about any unhappiness in the client base, we hear about that very quickly, we, re we can react quickly. And the result of that is we don't lose clients or seldom lose clients and have a churn rate of less than 2%. And we measure our client base in the number of uh, people that use our software every single day. And we're in 19 countries now with more than 40,000 people using our software every day. And we have less than a 2% uh, uh, loss rate. Uh, and that excludes the people, obviously, that we grow in. And we've been growing in, in excess of 30, 35% per year. Uh, so we're obviously doing something right at the client service level. And for us, that's our passion. Uh, we treat our clients as our partners. Uh, and uh, we have our ear on the ground. And we use the same system as we're trying to get them to use to manage the relationships with their clients. And that's been a very powerful thing for us because our revenue streams are based on a subscription revenue model, which means clients don't pay a big chunk of money up front. They pay for it as they use it. And if their practice grows to 100 people or 10 people, they reduce their practice in size, they pay according to what they use. So it's a consumption-based model as opposed to you pay this big chunk of money up front. And that's been really good because clients have been able to plan their growth. Uh, and every year, if they grow by five or 10 or 15 people or one or two people, they can manage the investment to manage the internal system so much easier. And that really is, is why we uh, focus on, on the whole customer relationship module to keep uh, the churn rate as low as possible and to build those relationships with our clients. In the subject of culture, uh, we have 
uh, about 15, 20 years ago, myself and my partner, uh, MTS Lorgat, realized that we're not going to be able to do this on our own. And we needed a team around us. And uh, MTS is very much a family man, as am I. And family is a major, major influence in our lives. And uh, we decided that we needed to make the family the priority for our business. So when people join our organization, uh, family is key. It's really, really important. The first thing we do when we interview anybody, we close our eyes and imagine spending four hours in a locked lift with that person. Because if we can't, then it's not going to be easy to recruit those people and live with them for a long time. The result of that is that we have many people that have been with us for a very, very long time. And uh, they've been able to be productive for a very long time. And the core values, the family values that come into the normal successful family, if you use those same values in a business of uh, respect, honesty, trust, all of those things, they filter through not only through to your team, but they also filter through to your clients. And if the client trusts, things don't always go right, but when they do go wrong, he trusts that you can fix it. And the employees, when they're having a bad patch, or an employee uh, goes away and uh, has, a, has a baby, they know that their, their roles are going to change when they come back. And if they can come back and work flexi time or, or still work that into their business, that helps build the culture. And for me, one of the highlights in the last few years has been we had a management meeting, uh, and I call it a team leaders meeting rather than a management meeting, uh, about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago. And I wasn't the uh, convener of that meeting. It was convened by an external convener. And the team sat around the table and they built what they decided was the core DNA of our business. And that core DNA for me was a very exciting thing. And some of the points that they raised were, uh, I own a problem, but we share it. It is a, something that they never on their own. Find yourself running partner so that if you have a problem, there's always a running partner. So you can get out of bed in the morning, you're going to go and run with that partner. You're not going to lie in bed and, and think I can miss today. And there, there's about 10 core values that they've built in. And when I look at those, they are the values that you would want to build a family on, build a business on, and build partnerships with your clients on. So those core values, I think, is what makes us successful. And uh, our, our team either survive there for a, a year. If they, if they leave within the first year, then they leave. But if they last more than a year, we have people that stay with us, uh, many of them more than 10 years, certainly more than half of them are more than 10 years, actually. And that's unusual when we grow in a team like we are. So uh, it is, uh, for me, very important that we get that core culture and structure right, and that's not negotiable. On that end, we spend a lot of time investing in the team. So we run two programs that everybody goes through. We call them Management Development Program 1 and MDP 2. Uh, and this is 10 days a year that we invest in everybody. And it's got nothing to do with the business. It's got to do with their EQ. For us, it's seriously important that we might have very clever programmers, but we also need programmers who've got an EQ that they can communicate at a very senior level with a senior accountant at an accounting practice or a partner in an accounting firm. So we invest a lot of time and effort into that. We also use an internship program, which we've been using for more than 10 years now, where we find young uh, graduates who may have one or two degrees, and these guys would join the team. But when they join the team, they, they have the degree for which they've studied, but they battle. They might be from a previously disadvantaged environment or not, but often they are. And when they join us, they come with a problem of their language, their home languages, and maybe not English, certainly not Afrikaans. Uh, and they, they need to be given the confidence to be able to speak to people at a, at a professional level because they've got the basic skills and learning. And we take a two-year program with each of those interns, and we do that every year, bring in new interns. But we take them for elocution lessons. And I think they appreciate the fact that we invest in them from day one. Uh, and uh, a lot of those people, certainly the majority, have either ended up in our consulting team or migrated to our clients. There's a number of our clients that have uh, made use of those people once they're qualified because uh, they spent two years training within our environment. They're very, very useful at our client site. And that comes back to the core values uh, of us when we come to recruit people and how we train people. Our journey where we uh, were learning to, to migrate from being a distributor of someone else's software to a developer of our own software, we reached the stage where we knew we had something, we didn't know what we had, but we wanted to do something with it. And between myself and my partner, uh, we selected an MBA that I could go and, and read for. And uh, this was at Business School Netherlands. But it was an MBA with a difference. It was an MBA based on, on each 
department within your office. So one on module on marketing, and module on business finance, a module on, but it was based on everything within your business. And we did this, and we made the decision, it was quite an ex expensive investment, that we would do this because we wanted to double our business. And within five years, we actually doubled our business. We thought, wow, this is fantastic. Within the next three years, we doubled our business again. And that we thought, we're doing really well. But at about that time, uh, uh, First National Bank contacted us and invited us to participate in their annual innovation award uh, process. It was actually the inaugural one, but they turned that into an annual event. And uh, they went through a very high level of scrutiny of, of our business. They, they really, the selection process to become uh, the innovation award winner for 2015 was really, really, uh, we had to jump through a lot of hoops. At the end of the day, they selected GreatSoft, which was fantastic, and I was selected to go to uh, Endeavor to be considered as an Endeavor entrepreneur, global entrepreneur. And when all of this was taking place, it was like someone was taking a weight off our shoulders or helping us to just open up and, and see the opportunity of what we really had. We were always so inward looking at what we were trying to deliver to our local market and to who we were competing with locally to realize that what we'd built in our cloud-based products were globally ahead of very, very big listed companies globally. Uh, the result is we've attracted attention of some of those companies now, but that's not the story. The story is we've uh, taken our results in, and we expect to double our business in the two years, where it's come from five years to three years. This year we're going to double our business. And that's off a lot bigger base than it was when it was going to five, the five-year scenario. But on our way to San Francisco, when we went to the, um, uh, in a, the final selection panel to become an Endeavor entrepreneur, I was, uh, had a lot of dealings with the FNB senior hierarchy at their business banking division. And we didn't really know what we had. We didn't know if we needed raise finance. We didn't know if we needed venture capital. We didn't know if we needed what we needed. And uh, speaking with them, they had a good look at our financials and they spoke us through it, and they realized that our balance sheet was a lot stronger than we realized, and that we didn't actually need funding to do the things that we wanted to do. We wanted to acquire a payroll business, we wanted to acquire a document management business, we wanted to do a few things, and we had the substance within our balance sheet to just acquire it from within our balance sheet. And we had cash that we hadn't used, and we had leverage that we hadn't used, and that gave us a lot of confidence. And in fact, uh, FNB really came to the party and helped us to fund the acquisition uh, of a couple of businesses, which those only happened in the 1st of December 2015, but we already seen unbelievable results, uh, certainly from the payroll side where uh, it's fantastic from an integration point of view. Our clients in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania are, are really taking advantage of this and some very big banks in Nigeria are taking advantage of this. So for us it's been, uh, they've given us the confidence I think to really say we do have something good. We are South African. We're not just this little uh, place down in the bottom end of, of Africa. We can develop something that can compete globally. Uh, and the end result of that in a very short space of time, we've signed up a distributor in the UK. We are busy with an acquisition in, in the States of a similar business to ours. So that innovation award has really helped us see that there's a lot more potential. And the benefit to our team has been unbelievable because we've seen people put their hands up and say, I want to be part of this. I want to be doing this. How can we do this? And to me, that's been, uh, been a major blessing. The reward for leadership to me, um, we have never had a focus of it being financial. Uh, my partner and I have never been totally uh, money driven. Um, money is important but it's never been the main priority. For us, we've continued to, to draw an adequate uh, drawings out of the business, but we have reinvested virtually everything we possibly can. And one of the benefits of our style of leadership has been the number of people that have come through our business, and we've not been able to keep them because they have just been such dynamic people that they've gone on to lead their own businesses. And there's a business that uh, listed recently for just under 250 million, and that leader came through our business and he started as a, as a hardware support guy and grew through the business, did his MBA while he's with us, was our general manager. And for me to have some people like that grow through the business uh, and actually see us as their mentors, 
we have a, a, a guy that contacts me frequently from the US. He's with a big consulting company in the US. And when he came out of university, we employed him, recruited him, coached him. And for me, that is one of the, uh, the credits of, of being a leader, is that I've been able to impact many young people positively. And uh, the, the money is a byproduct. And the money has never really been there. The money might be coming now, but it, it's, it's coming in drips and drabs. There, the recognition from, from that generation that we've been able to add value to their lives, and they've gone on to do fantastically successful things, has, has been good for me. Leadership is not all uh, an easy road, and often it's a very, very lonely road. And one of the benefits I found of being part of the Endeavor group is that loneliness is a little less now, because the Endeavor entrepreneurs, and if, if uh, very briefly, the Endeavor global group is a group of entrepreneurs who are out there to help uh, small businesses to, to scale and to grow. And uh, there's been more than 50,000 people through the Endeavor selection process to select entrepreneurs, and there's only been about 1,100 selected. So that's a very strict process. But what they do once you become an Endeavor entrepreneur is they provide you with a non-exec board, which you normally would not have. So as a leader on your own in your own small business, you face the wars on your own. And uh, when you have uh, an Endeavor partnership the way we do now, is I have a non-exec board who I can share these things with. So one of the really tough things of prior to the last 18 months being on your own is you're on your own and when things are going tough you really are on your own unless you have a partner uh, or some some silent shareholders who can come to the party that's a very very tough thing and you can't allow that to spill over into your team so there might be a terrible decision that you've made and it's costing you guys from a cash flow point of view and it's something's bleeding in one area but you cannot allow that to filter through to the the positive uh energy that you're building up in the rest of your team. And that's very tough often, and there's a takes a high toll on yourself. Um, and again, I find sport a reliever there. I get on my bicycle, and you ride for an hour, and you feel so much better when you've done that. But that's one of the real tough things, is being lonely. Um, the tough decisions, to make them early is something I learned uh, many years ago, to make the real tough decisions earlier rather than later. But to make those tough decisions, someone has to do them. And sometimes you might have recruited someone who you've earmarked to be the next uh, major leader and it doesn't work out as well as it could be. It's very, very hard to look uh, the guy or lady in the eyes and say, we really, it's not working out. We need to, to uh, move you somewhere, whether it's within the organization or out the organization. Those are very tough things for, for, uh, for me as a leader to, to do. It's a very personal thing. I take a personal interest in every one of our members, our team members. And uh, when that happens, it's, it's quite bruising, but those are things that have to happen. It's like uh, looking after your children. Sometimes you need to, to bring them on the straight and narrow, and that's not always easy. So tough love is sometimes a tough thing to do. And those are the two things I'd say, being lonely and uh, delivering those, um, those messages which are not always uh, uh, very easy and nice messages to deliver are the hard things for me. The work-life balance for me is an area that I really need to go back to possibly the luckiest day of my life, which was uh, about 31 years ago, virtually now in May, 31 years ago. I went on a blind date and I met my wife. Um, I met her on the Friday night, the Sunday night I told her I was going to marry her. Five weeks later we were engaged, six months later we were married. We've been married for 31 years, we have three children, um, and we've been really, really happy. And I mention this because from a work-life balance point of view, uh, there's no business leader that gets away without having to put in those 10, 12, 14 hour days and we all have to do that. And while you're doing that, the house and the home still need to keep together. And without uh, my wife Kathy putting that together, bringing those kids up in, and helping fill those blanks, it would never have been possible. And there are times when, you, when you're building the business that you don't have the time to go and train. Uh, there was a time that I, I did more than 10 to oceans, I've done close to 70 marathons. But then you get too busy to do that. And you say you're too busy, but you, you do get too busy because you've got that and you've got the family. And to put that together is very, very, very tough. So for a period of time, you maybe stop doing that. But you've got to get back to that because so many people today uh, die of heart attacks or whatever it might be. You need to get that together for your own sanity. You need to get it together for your family. And for us, as a successful family, we've got our three kids, they're still all at home. Well, they've been away and they've come back, and I consider that very successful, that we all want to be together. And the same approach in, in, the, uh, in the organization, uh, where I encourage people to family first. 
So you've got a problem at home, and that's the way it should be. And we have one of our leading salespeople, she's been with us for about 19, 18, 19 years now, left school, joined us, grew through the ranks from junior reception through to senior sales consultant. She's had two kids with us, and she works till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So from 8 until 2, she still achieves her targets so that she can spend the afternoons with her, with her kids and her family. And to me, that work-life balance is more important than anything else. My partner, uh, he's very religious, and he needs a lot of time to do the things that he needs to do, and that's been made available from the day we started this thing. And uh, that filters through to, to the process with our entire team. And for me, that's one of the reasons we're successful, is the team want to be there. They uh, appreciate the fact that we look after them. And uh, it's important that as a leader, we continue to be fit, continue to be healthy, because we need to lead from the front, and that's the way it should be.